Open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. Last uh, Sunday, if you would, uh, will recall, if you were here uh, with us, and um, I don't expect you to recall, but I will go ahead and summarize what we uh, have studied uh, last Sunday. We came to a verse, verse 13, that was basically a hinge verse, okay? Um, there is a noticeable break that Peter marks with this word, therefore, in verse 13. Remember, as I mentioned last Sunday, that verses 1 through 12, they uh, encourage us to praise God for this great salvation that we're now part of. That's what Peter says when in verse 3, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then goes through uh, our salvation that we have received. That's verses 1 through 12. And then in verses 13 through the rest of this chapter, he teaches us how to respond to this great salvation. So now that you've received, how do you live it out? How do you respond? In light of grace that you have received, Peter exhorts his readers to live a mark that is, or to live a life that is marked as this grace-filled people. All of you are filled with grace. All of you have been shown grace. How can we tell? How can your neighbor who's sitting next to you tell? In particular, he calls them to four things, four commands here, verses 13 through 25. The first command is he gives them in verse 13. Look with me there. He says, fix your hope. Fix your hope in verse 13 on this future grace that will be brought to you when Jesus comes back. That's the first command. In verse 15, he exhorts them to be holy in all your behavior, he says. And then in verse 17, he commands them to conduct themselves. Look with me at verse uh, 17. Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. And so all of these three commands here, they are primary, notice, vertical. Vertical. They um, teach us how to live before God, before our Father. If you address as Father, then live before Him in this way. This was last week. That's why the title of last week's sermon was How to Live in Light of Grace. Now, in our verses here, verses 22 through the rest of the chapter, verse 25, Peter proceeds to this final command, fourth command, that focuses on our life with one another, particularly in the body of Christ in the church. It is a transition from this vertical relationship to horizontal relationships. Um, and even though the orientation changes, the subject doesn't change here. In other words, the gospel of grace continues to loom large in this section. It continues to be the, the emphasis of the entire chapter because the gospel is not just an entry-level subject, right, in, in Christianity. It's not something that we just learn, like gospel 101, and then we move on to bigger and greater and deeper things in life. No, the gospel, as one uh, preacher said, it is the unchanging curriculum we study throughout our church, uh, Christian discipleship. And that's why Peter, again, roots this final command in the gospel. The therefore of verse 13 continues to impact verses 22 through 25. And that is why I want us to consider now how to love in light of grace. We were exhorted how to live before God in light of grace. Now, how do you love one another in light of grace? Of grace. I want us to read this entire section again, verses 13 through 25, and then we will look at the final four verses. 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges, according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, 
the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. As uh, Peter does in this previous section, he prefaces this final command. The final command is in verse 22, fervently love one another. That's the command. He prefaces this command, though, with this gospel reality again, gospel truth. In fact, what he does is he sandwiches it, gospel truth, command, and then gospel truth again. The first reality or the first truth, it um, looks at the gospel through the human lens, so to speak, from our standpoint. How do we get converted? And then this final reality, verses 23 through 25, looks at it from the divine standpoint. But both are meant to fuel your love for each other. Encourage and make us realize who we are and also then move forward in love. And if I was going to summarize this whole um, section here for you, it'll go something like this. We love because we live. Pretty simple, right? We love because we live. And he specifically in greater detail gets into this, that we love sincerely and we love fervently because we live purely and eternally. Sincerely and fervently because of our pure lives and eternal lives that, were, that was given to us, granted to us because of the work of Christ. So I want us to consider the how and the why we must love one another. How and the why. Number one, in verse 22, love sincerely for you were purified for a new life of love. Number one, love sincerely because you were purified for a new life of love of love. I love what what Peter does here, and and friends, uh, I want us to encourage to think about all the commands in our Christian life in view, again, in view of the gospel. I I hope you, you don't get tired of hearing this because this is very, very important. You cannot separate those two realities together. Peter wants to affirm something true of all Christians before he exhorts them to some kind of practice. The order of things is very important. So here's Peter's thought here in verse 22. We do not love one another to be saved. Rather, we love one another because we are saved. Okay? We do not love in order to earn something, to receive something like salvation. But because we have already received something unmerited, we are able and in fact are now commanded and empowered to love. Now, look with me back at verse 22. In the beginning of verse 22, it might be kind of confusing from first glance. Peter says that through obedience, you have purified your souls. Look at that. Since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls. What does that mean? Obedience to the truth, you purified your souls. Well, one possible meaning could be this, your souls are purified by your obedience to the truth. Namely, he goes on to say, sincere love of the brethren. So this is how some take this verse to mean, since, right, here's the command, love. When you sincerely love brethren, your soul is purified. Is that what Peter is saying? The answer must be resounding no. That's not what he is saying. You do not purify your souls by loving somebody, by obeying the command. 
this is kind of technical. The way NASB and ESV structures it together, uh, this, th this verse, it, it, it could become a bit confusing, but here's Peter's argument here. Look with me again at verse 22. Having purified your souls, that's your ESV version, or since you have purified your souls, how? By obeying, right? Fervently love one another. That's the command. Fervently love one another. So purified souls, they overflow with sincere love. Something has to happen before love flows out of you. How did we purify our souls? Peter says here, by obeying the truth. By obeying the truth. So your obedience to the truth, Peter is talking about, it results in this brotherly love. So love follows obedience. Love follows obedience. Obedience. But what specifically is he talking about? What obedience? And I think we really need to pause here and um, just say this, that contextually, Peter is not saying anything new. He hasn't said before. Okay? Uh, he is repeating what he had already stated. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through, or, or sorry, verse 2 rather. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. So Peter says, I'm addressing you as the scattered aliens, chosen aliens, who were chosen because God foreloved you. And sanctified you so that you would obey Jesus Christ. Obedience here refers to our conversion. It refers to this initial act of salvation. That's just another way of saying that you have believed the gospel. That you have um, identified yourself by faith with Jesus Christ and everything that he has done for you. In other words, the gospel is this, that Christ came, lived, and died. He died for your sin on the cross, and that you believe that you have died with him. That's obeying the gospel call. That he resurrected from the dead, and you believe that you were resurrected with Christ to newness of life. And so when you say, yes, when the preacher comes in and he preaches these things, or your mom shares the gospel with you, or your dad, or your friend, or whomever, when they bring you these words of life, you say, Lord, I believe that is equivalent to obeying the truth, obedience to the truth. So they obey the truth in that they heard it, they believed it. And they submitted themselves to it wholeheartedly. I want to just remind you of one passage in Romans 10, 16 that really brings this to the surface. Uh, Romans 10, 16, Paul writes this. However, they did not all heed, that's the word to obey, hear and obey the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. Do you see that? He says, they didn't all obey because Isaiah says, Lord, who has not obeyed but believed our report. And so he takes obedience, Paul, and he takes faith and he says, faith and obedience in this context, they're synonymous because the gospel comes to you and you need to respond to the gospel. You are called to repent, to believe, to confess, to trust, to turn, to receive this gospel. This is your response to the truth about your sin, about your separation from God, and about this only solution that is available in Christ Jesus. So when we believe, when you obey, you are then purified. Look back with me at verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. Purified, it means to be holy, to be declared holy. This word purified in, in this verse, verse 22, and the word holy in verse 16, look back up to the passage we studied last Sunday, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Uh, they, they share a common root and meaning. Purification, it begins at salvation when a person believes 
and he is set apart. Remember the, this, uh, I referenced this verse in prayer, Colossians chapter 1. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. That is the separation. Like once you belong in this pit of darkness serving another master, the gospel comes in. It is preached, the Spirit unites the preaching of the gospel with faith in your heart. And at that point, there's this conversion that happens. And when conversion happens, you are literally taken out of this one kingdom of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. And you are forever separated. You are sanctified. You are holy. Your soul is purified. Colossians, or uh, first, Second Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says this, you are now new creation in Christ Jesus. You become new. All things are gone away. Behold, new things have come. Who creates the new thing, new life, new heart? God does that. So you enter this new life. You enter this new course, completely new direction. It's interesting, this word purification in the... Old Testament, and it referred to all the ceremonial washing, all the external things that you would do in the temple. And Peter here, he ties this purity to the inner man, to the soul, meaning that it is the cleansing of your heart, of your mind, of your will. The entire person from inside gets cleansed. And this cleansing expresses itself in something great. How does this purification express itself? Look back at verse 22. This is amazing. Peter packs so much into this verse. He says, when you obey the truth, your soul is purified for a sincere love. This is the purpose statement. You are saved. Your soul is made new. New life is given to you so that you can love. Isn't that incredible? So that you can love. You were purified to a new life of love. Of love. Titus 3, if you recall, think about how would our old life be characterized? Paul says this, speaking of your old life before this transformation, he says, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures Spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, he says, and hating one another. This is how he describes our prior life. You were hateful and you were hating one another. But now, he says, your new life in Christ naturally leads to love. He says, for a sincere love of the brethren. Love of the brethren here, it's one word in the original, and it is the word from which we get the name Philadelphia. Philadelphia on the, on the uh, East Coast, right? Philadelphia, that's the, that's the word. And brother love, literally, brother love, meaning that we love one another because we are brothers. Isn't that what we tell our kids, like when they get in the fight? Like, hey, you need to love one another. Why? Because you're in our family. <laughs> that's why you belong to each other. All right, that's why we love one another. We don't need to get all fancy about the reason why we need to love one another. It's because we all belong to one family. That's why. You have our life here that we share, and that's why you love. You have these affection. Uh, brother love is, speaks about sincere love. Okay? Brother love. So think about this. Uh, physical birth, it makes you brothers by blood. Spiritual birth makes you brothers and sisters by grace. So all of us who have been born twice here, physically and spiritually, the reason why this command is there for us is because we have this new life of Christ flowing in us. And that's the characteristic of this new life. Love. But he says this, for a sincere brotherly love. For a sincere. Sincere means without uh, pretense, without show. It's something genuine. It's something that is really there. You're not putting on a face. You're not putting on a mask. And you're acting like something is there 
when it's not. It's authentic love. It's not theater, in other words. Christian love is not theater, where you put on a mask, act like you love one another. It's real. It's real. Why is it real? Well, because the life of Christ is in you. You have been purified. Your soul has been purified. You have been, as we will see, born again. Church, here's what Peter is doing. He says that it makes a big difference in our obedience to this command to love one another if we recognize that this type of love is a big part of God's goal for sending Christ to die for us. Do you get that? I know this was a long sentence. Let me break it down. God's goal for saving us or for sending Christ to die for us wasn't merely just to rescue us from hell. But according to this verse, he did that so that we would love one another for a sincere love. Regeneration, obedience, faith, so that you would love one another. Think about this. The whole gospel story, Christ's love, death, resurrection for us. Even beyond that, the ascension of Christ to the Father, intercession for us today. This promise to come back and to take us to glory. It was told to us so that we might believe it so, and by believing it, that we would be purified according to verse 22. And having been purified, we would love one another. So this is real. This is a reality. It's not something that Peter now says, hey, now you have the goods. Now go to the store, purchase the goods and start applying it. That's not even what he's saying. He's saying you've been given love already like you were born again to love you love because you live i think this truth needs to sink really deep in our hearts sincere love for one another is one of the things jesus gave himself up for on the cross in order to bring about and so peter then says now look at verse end of verse 22 fervently love one another now live out that purpose by loving love one another love sincerely in other words peter is like a coach peter is like a coach who tells a player you know you joined this team now go out there and play like if you signed up to be on the swim team and you go there and you just sit on the bench and you never swim. You're not on the swim team. If you signed up to play basketball, and if all you do is sit on the bench and never check into the game, you are not a basketball player. You're just a bench warmer. Um, you, you might be serving others. You might be, but you're not there in order to contribute in the game. And Peter says, God put you in the game. God regenerated you. To put you on the team, start playing. How? By loving. By loving. Same thing with a job. If you got a license to be a plumber or an electrician, right? If you got hired to perform this task, then go do what you were hired to do. Peter says you were regenerated. You were given second life, this new life to love. Go out and love. Go out and love. If you're a Christian... God didn't save you so that you can be selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed in life. No, you were saved so that you would love. And so the call now is fervently love. Start being oriented around the interests and welfare of other people. Love sincerely. Love unhypocritically. I'm sure we've all had people who acted nice to us when we were facing one another, talking, just even maybe encouraging one another, only to, to speak something evil behind your back. This is what Peter is saying. That's not the kind of love that we were saved for. Do not do this, but make sure you display genuine, unhypocritical love. Don't manipulate other people with your love. Don't love in order to take advantage of someone. That's not love. Why? 
Well, because of the gospel that you profess. Because of the gospel. You see how gospel orients everything we do in life. Um, everything we do must revolve around the gospel. It's not just the starting point. It is the hub around which everything revolves. I, I was reminded of uh, Peter. Remember Peter, how he ran into Paul in Galatians chapter 2. Um, so Galatians chapter 2 records events that happened about 20 years before this, before the writing of First Peter. And so Peter there in Galatians chapter 2, he, he seemed to be enjoying fellowship and love among the Gentile Christians in Galatia until some legalistic Christians came and uh, seemed to have um, scolded them, including Peter, for eating with the Gentiles. They were not following the law. And Peter evidently gives into this pressure. And then Paul sees Peter given into this pressure. He comes to Peter and he confronts Peter. And he says this, that Peter was not, quote, straightforward about the truth of the gospel. That's Galatians 2.14. Peter, how come you're not living in light of the gospel? In light of the truth you profess. So the gospel, Peter said, should have taught Peter to love and not to separate from fellow Christians over food matters. Okay? You know better, Peter. How come you profess something but are not living in accordance with your profession? And friends, this is also a really good question for, question for us to ask when we apply verse 22 here. Suppose someone wrongs you or speaks evil of you. And we're not talking about in your workplace. We're talking about here. Because this is brotherly love. This is one another love. This is Christian love. This is one professing believer loving another professing believer. Okay, so we're talking about this bunch right here. Suppose someone right here wrongs you, maybe speaks evil of you, maybe not to your face, but you get wind of it. What response is consistent with the gospel? What response would be consistent with the gospel? Anger? That's one response. Revenge? Gossip? I mean, we all respond in different ways, and, and some of our responses, they're just a combination of all of these. But for a believer, what, what's the right response? Maybe patience? Consistent with the gospel, with how Christ acts towards us. Um. Maybe forgiveness, seeking reconciliation. You see, this is the question that we need to be asking when we do anything. When you are offended, and beloved, you will be offended. You will be sinned against over and over and over again, especially if you really try to commit to loving someone. Like if you're at arm's length, um, then yeah, you, you might, you might um, escape that treatment. But if you really commit to one another here in this body, if you, like, you, you join a small group and you really get to know somebody and you begin to talk and you, you see some of the differences as you rub shoulders and you're going you're gonna to run into some issues that you're going to really have to work through. You're going to be offended. You're going to be sinned against. But guess what you need to do in that time? You will go back to the gospel that saved you. And you're going to go back there in order to get the power and to extend the grace that you've been given personally to extend that to others. That's what you're going to do as Christians, right? Go back to the gospel. Remind yourself of the grace that you have been given and the power that you have in order to ex ex extend the same to others. There's really no other way to love. That's the first lesson. Love sincerely for you were purified to a new life of love. The next three verses here, he gives us a second reason. Number two, love fervently. Love fervently for you were birthed to new life by the eternal word. Love fervently. Because you were birthed to new life. Notice once again how Peter sandwiches the command to love God with these two realities. Right? Since you were purified for a new life of love, love. 
Number two, he says, now love for you have been birthed to new life. Verses 23 through the end. Uh, I want us to look at the command again in verse 22. Fervently love one another. Peter says fervently. This word fervently, um, it could be translated as earnestly. I think ESV has it earnestly or deeply. Not superficial love, but deep love. And the idea here is of uh, love that stretches out. It, it is under such stress and, and tension. It's being pulled, but it's being, as it's being pulled, it, it's, it's elastic. It stretches. You're able to be spent for the benefit of another. It speaks of maximum effort. In fact, this, this term fervent, uh, it's used of Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, Luke records in 22, uh, Luke twenty two forty four that he was praying very fervently. That's the same word. And his sweat became like drops of blood. Luke also records in Acts chapter 12 when Peter was in prison that the church was praying for Peter fervently, stretching, being spent in prayer. And Peter calls us here to do something that requires straining, straining. It's a, it's a command to actively love one another in this sacrificial way that is hard work because any sacrifice is hard work. To love in a way that sometimes goes against our natural preferences. We don't always, or I should say usually, incline to love this way. It's an active love that seeks the good of our brothers and of our sisters, even when we would naturally not want to deal with them at all. That's why Peter uses a different word here. In our English translations, um, sincere love and fervently love. Love, love, they're the same, but in Greek there's a little nuance here. It's different, right? The first one is brotherly love, and this is the agape love. This is the godly love that resolves to love. It's a call to give up yourself in order to serve the needs of another. It's not a call to necessarily feel something, but it's a call to do something like Christ. Where do we get this power to love this way? And Peter says, you get this power to love in your new birth because you're new, because you're alive. Now you're able to love. We have a new life of Christ, dear friends. You have new lives. We love because we live. Here's the difference in verse 22, it expresses believers' personal involvement. Like you have cleansed your souls because you have believed and obeyed. But here in verse 23, for you have been born again, it expresses God's involvement in your salvation. It is God who gives you birth. You had nothing to do with it. You played absolutely no role in you being born. It's the same thing that Peter says in verse 3, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. Born again. You have new nature. You have eternal nature. But here he gives a little bit more detail. Here's what Peter is saying. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. Think about this. He says, listen, like an earthly father possesses a seed that produces natural children. You, you, you get what he's saying here, right? Fathers, earthly fathers, they pass on a seed that gives life. So does God, your heavenly father, has a seed that produces life, that produces spiritual children. One is perishable, the other is not. So, we were born the first time, all of us here, um, through Adam's seed that was passed down from one generation to the next. But the life that is produced from man's seed, it will always perish. That's what he's saying. Biological birth, right, always ends in death. It always ends in decay, destruction. That's procreation. There is end to procreation. However, God 
has given us regeneration, a new nature by his word. That's the seed, for you were born of this seed which is imperishable, that is living and enduring. Real quickly, I want to men, uh, just mention briefly what each one means, imperishable. Peter loves this truth of something being imperishable. In verse 4, he says, your inheritance is imperishable. In verse 7, he says that our faith is imperishable. In verses 18 and 19, he says the price that was paid for our redemption is imperishable. That is the blood of Jesus Christ. And now he says, God's word is imperishable. What's the point? These things always exist and they always stand. Why? Because God stands. God stands because Jesus, the resurrected Christ, he stands and he forever lives and he forever lives. Forever. That's the point. So if you have been birthed by this imperishable seed, friends, you do not have an end. You have eternity in you. And that is your hope. Fix your hope. Goes back to verse 13. Fix your hope because you have new life. Not only is this word imperishable, it is living, it produces life. He speaks and life comes. It gives life. And that's why we preach it. That's why we proclaim it. That's why we read it. That's why we study it. That's why we share the gospel. Because we believe, according to the word, that these words are power. Romans 1.16, right? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and active. James chapter 1 verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, imperishable living, and look at the final one, enduring. It's permanent. It's not changing. And since the word is not changing, whenever that word is spoken into your heart, it changes you. It changes you. It brings new birth. It takes up its permanent residence in your heart and it continues to produce fruit. And Peter proves this statement about this power and permanence of God's word by quoting Isaiah 40 verse 6 here in verse 24. All flesh is like grass. All its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord remains forever. Isaiah here use these words in Isaiah 40 in order to comfort his people as they were in exile. And um, uh, he speaks to them because as they are exiled from their land, they're looking at everything around them. They're looking at this powerful Babylonian nation and they're like, there's no way, there's no way we're going to be back. From human perspective, their uh, hope, their case seemed absolutely hopeless. Babylon, it was one of the most powerful and impressive kingdoms on the earth. Uh, it just seemed impenetrable. You, you mean to tell us that someone is going to take over them and, and we're somehow going to be allowed to go back and, and God's word is going to come true? But God says, listen, don't be fooled by the outward appearance of Babylon. It will fade like flower. Trust my words. They will last forever. That's the context of Isaiah 40 verse 6. Trust my words. They will last forever. Church, for us, like as we uh, think about this context and as we look at our own lives, um, here's the application. Everything that is human, everything that is produced by the seed of man and the hands of those men, every human generated work of art, every human generated idea, every building that is built, every book that is written, every army, every human government, everything that is human, it will disappear one day like flower of grass. Nothing will remain. But that which comes out of the truth through the spirit and that which comes out of the word of God, especially out of the preaching of the gospel, that will last forever. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And Peter concludes it and he says, and this is the word which was preached to you. The gospel was declared to you. Having been born again, you believe, and now you have this new eternal life that will last forever. So, if the new life of Christ is in you and will last forever, you need to be doing that which will last forever. That's Paul or Peter's uh, call here. 
do that which will last forever. We, we should not organize our lives around what will disappear in the next fad or will be replaced by some new technology or will be destroyed in the next fire or flood or will be frustrated by the next election or a war that happens. Don't orient yourselves, your, li your lives around that. Well, what can we invest then in that will last forever? And Peter says, love. Fervently love. That's his point. We should love one another because of the radical way the word of God has changed us and the hope that it instills in all of us. Love one another. Because we have been radically changed, just give you some thoughts here maybe to take away with you. Uh, stretch out in your love. What does it mean to fervently love? Here are some examples. You know, we can, we can spend time and energy sacrificing for the needs of others. That's agape love. Whether throughout the week, on Sundays, in our live groups, stretch out to help someone, minister to someone. Uh, we can cover multitude of sins. We can put away our lists of grievances that we hold against each other. We can overlook, here's another very practical one, we can overlook certain um, maybe pesky habits that we all have um, that we can't really call sins, but we just, you know, they irritate us some, one another, maybe in our families, maybe husband and wife, maybe close families here. Um, and here's the, the thing, these pesky habits, they won't last into eternity. So we can put up with one another knowing, knowing that we have fixed our hope completely on the grace to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Like what's, what's, what's 40 years, right, of putting up with one another? But in light of eternity, that was Peter's earlier argument here. We can bless those who desire uh, who do not desire our good. We can receive loving reproofs without being defensive. We can risk making reproofs that would otherwise be int interpreted as unloving. That's all stretchy love, straining love. We can look upon each other as new creations in Christ who are constantly changed by the power of God. You know, sometimes we look at one another and we see, you just see Tim. You see Tim and all of his um, uh, human frailty and you're like, yeah, that's really hard to love or, or whoever, put that name there. But I, the call here is new creation. Look at each other and say, he's a believer. He's a Christian who will inherit new heaven and new earth and we will live together there. And so love one another for these spiritual realities not just the present quirks. We can fervently love one another from the heart. That's the call here. So beloved, we, we love because we live. God gave us new life through the preaching of the gospel, which was united by faith. Someone preached the gospel to us. He regenerated us. We believed. We were made new. Now, having these new hearts, they are filled with love. We can love each other sincerely and fervently. If this community has been transformed by the gospel into the image of Christ, and it has been, and all of us are destined to be glorified with Christ, and we are, then love should be the priority. Love, not the external matters of the flesh that will just fade away. Maybe you're here and some of you um, do not have this life. Maybe you don't have the life of Christ in you. Maybe you've heard the gospel many times. Maybe this is the first time. You must be born again to possess this love and to experience this kind of love. That's, that's been the entire argument of First Peter. Trust God. Believe in Christ. He declares to you this very moment that he's your only savior. 
You want to love like this fervently, sincerely? You need a fervent Savior. Acknowledge Him, and He is there. He rescues sinners from sin, and He empowers them to love. Be born again. Have this new life and love this way. That's the call. Four things. Fix your hope. Be holy. Fear, verse 17. Vertical and horizontally, fervently love one another. If we profess to know Christ, if we profess to believe the gospel, this will be true of us. May we pray now and this week that this would be true of us. Let's bow down. Lord, we thank you for the clarity of your word, for the power of your word, because it is imperishable, it is living, it will endure forever. Your words never come back to you void. They produce fruit. And so even as the gospel and the word was preached right now, I pray that you would produce in us a certain desire, a longing to do and to be what we are, are already, Lord, in reality. I pray fill us with your love. May your love control us. Love for Christ, love for one another. We pray, confront us as we go home and as we meet together with our live groups this week. I pray, give us grace to apply these truths practically to our lives as teenagers, as young adults, as seniors, um, as those with older kids and younger kids. How do we practice these things? I pray, teach us much. We thank you and we praise you for your glory and our good. Amen.